Hello, I'm Mark Ransible. I'm from the Karlsruhe Institute of Technology in Germany and the University of Edinburgh in the United Kingdom. And I'm going to be talking to you in this AIMS primer about agent-based modeling of the land system. So first of all, why are we interested in the land system? Of course, land is a vital component of the broader earth system. It provides us with the food we eat, and the air we breathe and the space we live within. It regulates the climate system through carbon sinks and it regulates the flow of water. It also provides a range of other ecosystem services from recreation to aesthetic landscapes and cultural identity. Land also provides space for the myriad organisms with whom we share this planet, the essential biodiversity of life on Earth. But land resources are under considerable pressure and the human use and exploitation of land is accelerating at unprecedented rates. The animation that you're seeing in this slide shows a reconstruction of past land use change from the 1960s in the Amazon region of South America. And it demonstrates the typical types of land use changes that we've observed in the past. The expansion in this case of pastoral land uses for livestock grazing and the expansion of cropland into pristine native tropical forests. Other parts of the world have similar types of land use changes over this period of time, other parts of the world quite different changes. So for all the reasons that I've been explaining to you so far, it's critical that we seek to explore how land use systems may also change going forward into the future. But of course, we don't have any observations of the future. So in order to be able to explore and experiment with alternative futures, we need to develop models. In this case, we need models of land use change, models of the land system. And essentially, this is what this talk is about. I'm going to be talking about land use change modeling to explore future scenarios of land use change with a particular focus on the use of an emerging class of models called agent-based models. So to begin at the beginning, land use modeling is actually surprisingly been going on for a very long time. It has a very long history. So I'm going to start with the British classical economist, David Ricardo, who around about 1809, he formulated the notion of what's termed Ricardian land rent. So land rent in this case refers to the economic return that land accrues in its productive use. And what Ricardo, what Ricardian land rent was assuming is that the best quality land is used for the most productive purpose and that the goods that emanate from the productive use of that land are sold into competitive single price markets. In a way, Ricardian land rent refers to something that these days we might call land suitability, that the most, that the physical characteristics of the land are the things that largely determine its use and management. And if we move through the 19th century, we get to Johann Heinrich von Thunen, who came up with this idea of a model of an isolated state working within Germany. And von Thunen extended the Ricardian land rent principle by introducing geography. He introduced the notion of distances to markets and distances that were associated with costs, or primarily transport costs. But also he introduced the notion of other production costs, as well as looking at the Ricardian land rent of productivity, or in this case, within this formulation, the yields that one derive from productive activities. And in von Thunen's isolated state, he created this schematic uh, representation of land use forms of this sort of circular pattern of different types of intensity of use of productive land, driven largely by the effect of distance on costs. So in these early days, much, much of the ways in which we think about land use and land use modeling are based on traditional economic paradigms. This is classical economics. But interestingly, the principles of Ricardo and von Turnen are still used today in, in land use modeling, primarily, for example, in the use of economic optimization models to look at agricultural land use change. So the example on the right hand side of this screen 
shows um, an optimization model for Europe. It's based on a technique called linear programming, where the assumption is that land users are maximizing profit and minimizing their costs. And this simple stylized scenario looks at the changes in land use from the top map to the lower map, which arise from assumptions about increases in the quantity of food imports. So one can observe the change in the economic decision-making that arises from that. And these types of approaches are used widely. Um, they are in fact the dominant paradigm in large scale global models of land use change. They're now embodied in slightly more sophisticated approaches than Ricardo and von Thunen, encapsulated with the computable general equilibrium models or CGEs or partial equilibrium models that are primarily coupled with or embedded with the integrated assessment models that are used extensively within Earth system analysis, primarily to look at the impacts uh, and adaptation to climate change and potential for land-based mitigation. But those basic economic paradigms have certain limitations. They have certain assumptions which are necessary for their formulation. They're assuming rational economic behavior. They also assume perfect knowledge that land users, when they make their rational economic choices, are perfectly informed about the availability of markets, prices and costs of their various decisions and actions. You know, they also, to a very large extent, assume a certain amount of homogeneity between and amongst land users. That means that those land users are all primarily rational beings making rational economic choices. So in many cases, the whole notion of behavior and behaviors that underpin land use in many of these approaches are distilled down to economic behavior. And we know that economic behavior is incredibly important. It's not to say otherwise. But we also know from empirical evidence that land use decisions are made on the basis of factors other than economics alone. So I have some example, uh, one example at least to show you an alternative vision. So this is Torsten Hagerstrand, who was a, a Swedish geographer based in, the, in Lund University. And he was uh, observing data from actually as, way, as far back as the 1920s and the 1980s, although he was actually working in the 1960s, about the uptake and use of new management techniques for pastoral systems in, in southern Sweden. And what Hagerstrand observed is that there was a process of exchange about knowledge of these management practices between individual land users. So he set out to try and create a simulation approach that could represent the uh, empirical evidence that he had before him. So what he created was a system of trying to represent farmers through what he termed a mean information field. So if you look at the farmer, the farmer is located within a probability matrix. And what that matrix is trying to represent is the probability of contact between that farmer and other farmers within the landscape. And therefore through that co physical contact process of the exchange of information about knowledge, about how to manage pastures differently in this area. So that mean information field represented through that probability matrix was implemented in a simulation approach by Hagerstrand using a Monte Carlo based approach. And as you can see on the right, the fairly rudimentary maps that were created from that showed the spread of adoption of this new management technique through this region of southern Sweden. So this was a really interesting concept. In fact, there's no economics in this at all. This is purely about the exchange of knowledge between individual uh, land users. And whilst that was especially important within this particular context, we of course also know that knowledge diffusion is not the only social process that's critical in understanding the decision-making processes of land use and management. There are all sorts of issues around Risk, uh, reaction to risk, about resistance to change, about the notion of tipping points and social instabilities, about how land users reflect on their position, their status within their local communities, not wanting to enact land uses or management practices that they would see that they would deem to be unacceptable to their peers. There's inheritance, there's kinship. There's a whole range of relationships and social networks through family groups and other types of interactions. 
So many, many complex social processes that we know exist from empirical evidence, from social elicitation methods, from social surveys, from empirical social sciences research. So the question is, how can we move on from the economic paradigms to embed a stronger representation of social processes that underpin behaviors that underpin land use decision making? And that's where a whole new class of land use modeling approaches has emerged over the last 10 to 20 years. And this is a generic form of modeling known as agent-based modeling, or sometimes referred to as multi-agent modeling. And ABM, agent-based modeling, is, is very much a generic term which represents a range of different approaches and different methods. Some of those approaches are more strongly embedded in theoretical constructs. Some of the approaches are more firmly grounded within, within empirical evidence and data. But there are a number of, of characteristics about agent-based modeling that all of these models have in common. They're primarily characterized by the notion of agency. So for the purposes of this talk, I'm defining agency as the capacity of actors to affect other actors within a system and for those actors to interact with their environment and also to change their environment. And the agents themselves are heterogeneous. They all have individual behavioral attributes, which means that they behave differently. And those behaviors mean that they make decisions in different ways as well. Those agents are goal oriented and they interact with one another in a multiple different ways, including, for example, competition, the competition for land, competition within markets, but also they cooperate. They cooperate through social networks, through, for example, the exchange of knowledge in a more hagestrat type approach. And there are many different methods through which agent based models can be implemented. Many of these models are very qualitative, quite often rule based which means that they can be very firmly based, um, embedded within social elicitation and social survey methods that collect empirical data about how people behave and how they make decisions. But the models can also be quantitative, they can to some extent be algorithmic, and they can be a mixture of qualitative and quantitative approaches. So let me just give you some examples of what agent-based models look like and the types of things they can do, drawing heavily from my own research into agent-based modeling of land use change. So one of the other challenges that agent-based models face is trying to deal with multiple individual agents, with multiple individuals, all of whom are uniquely and individually different. And there could be millions of agents depending on the size and the type of system that's being investigated. One of the solutions to that has been the notion of trying to construct typologies, categorizations of individuals around their different attributes. So an approach which is often called the construction of agent functional types, which in many ways is very strongly analogous with what vegetation modelers did when they tried to upscale vegetation models from regional to global scale levels through the introduction of plant functional types. Again, a categorization to simplify and, and generalize the complexity of individuals within a system. An agent's function uh, within capital space, I'll tell you more about that in a moment, and they compete for that capital space with one another in order to make decisions about who finally adopts a particular uh, land use parcel of land. So to take these notions a little bit further, let me draw on, on a model I've worked with quite extensively with colleagues uh, in Edinburgh and in Karlsruhe, which is known as the Crafty Modeling Framework. Crafty stands for the competition for resources between agent functional types. It's a modeling framework which has had many different realizations in different or implementations within different geographic domains. So let's just unpack this. This is one way of agent based modeling. There are different ways, as I was saying earlier, but this does give some insight into the general principles that many of these types of models have in common. So, first of all, we try to establish the attributes of location in geographic space. Commonly, that geographic space would be divided up into a gridded landscape of multiple layers of different ways of describing what that space looks like, what are its attributes. And those attributes could be the natural capital, if you like, the Ricardian land rent perspective, or the productivity or yield of that land for different purposes. 
But there are also a whole range of socioeconomic attributes, which we term as socioeconomic capitals. We have natural capital, uh, in addition to which we have human capital, social capital, manufacturing capital, and financial capital. So social capital can refer to the ways in which people interact through social networks, for example, the strength of those interactions in practice. Human capital could be levels of education. It could be life expectancy, other intrinsic attributes of people. Financial capital could be access to loans. Um, it could be access to microfinance. And manufactured capital could be the road network, infrastructure that allows the transport of goods from a productive location to the location of the market, very much in the von Thunian perspective of land rent. But at the same time, we recognize the attributes of individual agents. What are their roles? You might have a livestock farmer, a crop farmer, a forester who's, forest, who's managing um, natural uh, forest species, or another forester that's going for clear fell, rapidly growing species. So they have different functions, different roles. They have different behaviors, different attitudes towards risk, different attitudes towards resistance to change, giving in and giving up parameters are things that we define specifically and explicitly within these models. They have benefit functions, which are a little similar to some of the economic concepts of utility functions. They compete with one another, they cooperate within social networks, and they supply, in our framing here, different types of ecosystem services. So in driving the model, we prescribe a society that has demands for these different types of ecosystem services, everything from food, timber, fiber, aesthetics, recreation, carbon stocks, water regulation, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, the things I was talking about earlier. So the agents then compete for this capital space in supplying different baskets of ecosystem services that are demanded by society. And at the same time, we drive our models with alternative future scenarios of changes in both the socioeconomic baseline, but of course, changes in the climate system itself, where the climate system changes are translated into changes in natural capital, productivities and yields, and the socioeconomic scenarios drive changes in the social, human, manufactured and financial capitals, but also, if you follow this line at the bottom, directly impact upon the attributes of individual agents within these different worldviews of emerging societies and emerging governance systems. So that's how we represent both the attributes of agents, the attributes of ge geographic space, and the drivers of those changes within our types of models. And we could do things like this. This is a model, a, a realization of Crafty that was created for Sweden. Uh, along the principles I've just been introduced to, introduced to you, introducing to you. And it looks at how you can model the spatial patterns and distributions of different types of owners of forests. We're very much focusing on forest systems within, within this particular implementation. And as you see, you have these different types of owners who represent different objectives, multi-objective, productionists, conservationists, but also the different types of tree species that they're interested in managing and planting within these different environments. And we can force the model to look at how those patterns of land use might change, very much like I've demonstrated here in the second example of a crafty implementation. These are simulations undertaken for Great Britain, England, Wales, and Scotland, which are projected out to the year 2080 towards the end of this century. And these projections are based on the well-known RCP SSP scenario framing. So the representative concentration pathways, which represent different levels of climate change and the shared socioeconomic pathways, which represent different perspectives on how socioeconomic, that socioeconomic world may develop into the future. So we have here a low climate change world as RCP 2.6, and on the right, high climate change world, RCP 8.5, and two different social economic sets of assumptions, more of a, an equitable, environmentally friendly world, an SSP 1, and an SSP 5 world, which is very strongly uh, driven by the use of fossil fuels and, and lower concerns for environmental impact. And what you can see is you get very different patterns of land use emerging from the different assumptions that drive the models in different ways. A couple of things that I just highlight here, which I think are, are particularly important, 
is that we're not only interested here in looking at land use per se, i.e. the difference between whether it's a grassland or a cropland, in this case, pastoral and arable systems, but we're also interested in the level of intensity of management. And this is really critical in underpinning and understanding land use decision-making. So in this case, if you look at the legend and you look here for both pastoral and arable systems, we've used the saturation, the, the darkness of the color in each case to represent the intensity of use. So in SSP5, you see the lowland ag arable agricultural areas are highly intense. They're very dark brown in SSP5, but a much paler brown in SSP1 because you have lower, uh, lower agricultural inputs in order to have benefits for the broader environment. You'll also see here these sort of pinkish colors in SSP1 represent sustainable arable production. So something that's more akin to an organic production system, which is consistent with the assumptions with us in SSP1. But because also in SSP5, we have this high, very strong intensity of use within lowland agricultural systems. We have popping up in the upland areas, these dark, these black areas, which represent conservation woodlands. In other terms, these are actually areas of land that are abandoned for commercial activities and given over to rewilding, but they're for conservation purposes because the land no longer has in a Ricardian sense a productive use and is instead used for nature conservation. It's an ironic outcome for an SSP5 world, which is very strong or not very concerned about environmental impacts. An example of how sometimes with these models, there are emerging outcomes that sometimes seem perverse based on the assumptions that go into the input scenarios of these types of simulations. So another example of, of a crafty implementation is a pan-European perspective. And I'm showing you this because of uh, the, the idea that increasingly in the agent-based world, we are more and more concerned about can we begin to scale up from regional, national, continental, and potentially global scale levels in order to use the important understanding of behavioral processes to inform the broader impacts on the earth system, something which we don't do in land use modeling at global scales currently. But in this example, the, the map on the bottom right is actually using the same model I showed you in an earlier slide. It's, a, it's an economic optimization model of the distribution of land use across Europe. The, the classes aren't particularly important in this case. But in the top example, the crafty agent-based model has been used in order to uh, change the parameterization so that we can begin as you go from left to right to more closely mimic the types of outcomes that are simulated by the economic paradigm model alone. So we basically increase food prices to make economics in more important than some of the other more socially orientated processes represented within the model. And whilst these two maps on the right hand side are still quite different, they are more similar than the original crafting map at this end of the simulation. The other thing you might observe, which is a very strong difference between these two maps, is the heterogeneity of the spatial patterns that are generated from the agent based model compared with the quite blocky patterns, consistent patterns of land use that emerge from the economic optimization approaches. And that's something which is quite different in terms of the different approaches. So I mentioned that one of the ideas we would like to push forward in term, terms of agent-based models looking forward into the future is can we start modeling the whole globe? Again, this is the Hilda Plus data set that I showed you at the beginning of this talk, uh, which just shows the changes between 1960 and 2019 from the reconstructed past of changes in forest areas, forest loss, forest gains, and forest losses and gains in different parts of the, of the world. So can we use agency-based approach, agent-based models, to begin to simulate these types of patterns of land use change, change going forward into the future for these different scenarios that can still enable us to embed our understanding of the social processes that we know are critical in understanding behaviors and land use decision processes, which hopefully I've tried to communicate to you in this talk. And that is one of the reasons within the AIMS project and within the Global Land Program, we've created a joint working group called the Large Scale Behavioral Models of Land Use Change Working Group that is trying to grapple with some of these 
problems. The challenges are trying to upscale agent-based models from lower scale levels to the global scale level. What are the theoretical considerations that are necessary to do that? What are the conceptual issues around doing that? And can we use empirical evidence to parameterize models in sensible ways that enable us to address a whole range of earth system challenges related to climate change, the loss of biodiversity, et cetera, et cetera. If you're interested therefore in these types of issues that I've been presenting in this talk, then I suggest you very much have a look at the working group and sign up to some of the activities that we plan within the AIMS project in the future. So fi finally, just a quick point to acknowledge our many collaborators and sponsors within the AIMS project and thank you very much for your attention.